Durian fruit fact of today. It smells. Some people describe the smell as similar to rotten onions or raw sewage. Others describe it as having a pleasantly sweet smell. Because of that, it essentially has an acquired taste, where even if an initial tasting results in you throwing up from both ends, you can get a bit of immunity with repeated exposure. I mean, normally you wouldn't put something that smelled like your dad's shoes after a triathlon in your mouth, but you might end up liking it after doing it enough times, right? Second durian fruit fact of the day, rance is a durian fruit. The genesis of the Rance series can actually be traced all the way back to 1989, making it one of the oldest running series in the industry. And that's not only limited to Eroge. Metroid, Final Fantasy, and the Super Mario franchise, some of the longest recurring titles to date are only two to three years its senior. In an effort to deliver something unique that can stand out in the competitive market, it was originally pitched as a sexy game, but with a piece of sh** protagonist that effectively translated into making a man with nothing but uh, copulating on his mind go around on some adventures in a generic fantasy setting. While it may not have an inherent widespread appeal or broad target audience, the series ultimately evolved into a deep, comprehensive universe with an expansive cast of characters and cemented itself as the biggest Eroge series in history. And for good reason. It balances out aspects from several genres, varying types of gameplay, and rather fairly well done storytelling, it's more adult oriented content notwithstanding, and delivers an ultimately complete experience, but more importantly, it's pretty damn entertaining. And it's something I've been wanting to share for quite a while now. It all started with Rans 1. This game is f***ing ancient. Its visuals are outdated, its dialogue is written by a 12 year old, and its gameplay is more deprecated than the Stone Age. 25 years later, a green clay pot set. We should remake that one! And so they did. And now nobody remembers this exists. And neither should you. That's why we'll mainly be talking about Rance 01 in this video. You'll thank me later. Rant Zero One is the first game in the Rant series. It's an ADV RPG, putting it somewhere between a visual novel, an RPG, and a point-and-click sort of problem-solving adventure. I actually found it to be pretty intuitive, though that's probably attributed to the fact that I haven't played that many ADVs overall. For some reason, somebody decided that it was a good idea to make the UI casino-themed. And it was. You walk through playing cards, you fight by throwing casino chips at your opponents, and you interact with the environment through five options. Though, that last one's more about the gambler than the casino itself, I suppose. The combat is pretty simplistic in nature. While it is turn-based, you attack in the same turn as your enemy, but your stats are modified by the chips you use during said turn. For example, using a weapon chip increases your attack by a set value, a shield would increase your defense, and so on. Its simplicity can make it redundant at times, though really which RPG isn't. But your progress and rate of improvement are very easy to keep track of and it's pretty satisfying to slap bosses or trash mobs with a 15k damage crit. Damn, that feels good. But as this is a story-driven video game, how the story holds up is arguably the most important aspect of the experience. So let's uh, talk about that. Yeah. The game begins with Rance, a seemingly picky and arrogant adventurer accepting a missing person's search request. The missing person's name is Hikari Miblong, but I'll call her generic redhead since she doesn't really matter that much. Dragging his travel companion comes Eva Long. They eventually reach the Lisa's castle town to investigate. I say travel companion, but while well, she is in fact the main heroine, she 
doesn't really play that big of a role for most of the game, as she's immediately sent to enroll in the missing girl's school while Rance prances around the castle town. He crashes at an inn, without pain of course, before finding out that a local gang of thieves has kidnapped the bartender's daughter. With unbelievable mental gymnastics, he puts one and one together and realizes that they probably kidnapped the other girl as well. I mean, what are the odds that two separate kidnapping incidents in the same town at around the same time would be completely unrelated, right? Right. He then heads out to the thieves' hideout to uh, rescue the girls, without any ulterior motives, of course. But as he continues on with his investigation, he notices he's being followed by kind of, I mean, an unnamed girl in a school uniform throughout several occasions. Which, of course, can only be attributed to the fact that she has a crush on him, so that's clearly just his irresistible country bumpkin charm at play. Nothing to worry about. After some detours, he eventually makes it to the bandit boss and slaughters him where he stands, saving the girl in the process. Yep. Nothing untoward happens at all during this part. I mean, who would choose to take advantage of a vulnerable, blindfolded person right after freeing them from their oppressor, right? He'd have to be a real piece of shit to- Yeah, he cyberbullies the girl he's supposed to save. This seems like a good time to address this particular theme of this franchise. As far as I know, the most successful formula in writing, commercially, is the three-act format. With the necessary inclusion of one to several relatable traits in the main cast, which can definitely come off as rigid and predictable. Of course, there's always room for creativity, and subtle details can make or break a product, even if it is the same old cookie-cutter formula. In that aspect, France does stand out in some ways in my opinion, even if some parts of the overhead plot and character archetypes are a bit formulaic, it's very far removed from the typical blank slate self-insert protagonist, and that gives it a certain weight in terms of consequences. Now, I'm not trying to justify the MC's actions by any means. There's no sugar coat in it, that shit is vile, and can be very uncomfortable to read through, but the series does manage to keep a sort of light-hearted tone to itself. The difference from what's grown to be a stale and predictable storytelling is what ultimately left an impression on me, so I wanted to make a note of that. I feel like as long as a certain level of respectfulness to the audience and the medium is being kept, it really doesn't make sense to play it safe all the time. That's a topic we might discuss in detail in another video. Alright, uh, back to the story. So, after cyberbullying the girl, he finds out that she was the only one the bandits kidnapped. No generic redhead, unfortunately. Of course it couldn't be that easy, but after bringing her back uh, safe and sound, he gets ambushed by kind of, uh, I mean, an unnamed ninja threatening him to abandon his investigation. He fends her off fairly easily, but she retreats into the castle grounds. Pretty incompetent to lead an investigator straight into your HQ without taking any detours. This is like Criminal 101 here, and she's a ninja. Uh, anyway. He tries to follow her inside the castle, but he doesn't have a pass, so he gets blocked at the gate. Though, that gets resolved pretty fast thanks to the timely intervention of the mysterious Sarma Lilis Mary. Hmm. I wonder if that's an anagram of her real name. By now, he finds out that there's someone called Ninja Master in the Coliseum. It has to be the one he's after, right? I mean, what are the odds that two ninjas that exist in the same castle would be completely different people, right? Unfortunately, he needs a second pass to fight in the Colosseum as a participant. Sounds kind of stupid when I say that out loud, actually. But naturally, he goes to a graveyard, cons an innocent girl into naked wrestling with him, and uh, as logic dictates, gets the Colosseum pass as a result of their coitus. He does eventually fight his way to the Ninja Master, and... Oh no. Who could have seen this coming? It's actually not the ninja he was looking for the whole time. So anyways, he kills that guy. Fortunately, his performance so far ostensibly leads to the crown princess taking note of him, and she ends up hiring him for a ghost-busting job in her private summer mansion. The ghost turns out to be a girl the whole time, so Rance decides he wants to spray the wrong kind of holy water at her instead. He then fends off an evil gorilla throwing barrels at him from the second floor, so he smashes them with his trusty hammer, digs through the gorilla's shit for a nice shield, and unlocks a mechanism that is extremely difficult to spot that leads to the basement. Digging around some more, he finds and unlocks two rooms where he finds some girls, naked and afraid, being actively abused by their captor. As it turns out, the princess was a kidnapper the whole time. Wow, who could have thought? 
So Rance does the natural thing and frees them from their restraints. Okay, he cyberbullies them too before he does that. Jesus Christ. With this new information, Rance confronts the princess directly, where she very easily fesses up and tells him that her plan all along was to add him to her collection. I mean, everyone in this game is all kinds of f***. He attempts to attack her in retaliation for her crimes, but gets one shot in the cutscene instead. Still beats winning in the fight, but losing in the cutscene anyway, so... That's a plus, I guess. He gets timely rescued by Pink Fluff, and a chase ensues as the princess and her attendant retreat into an emergency escape passage. I guess they couldn't call the guards with a bunch of dildos laying around all over the room. It's just poor hindsight. Ninja Girl gets taken down for good in an obscenely difficult boss fight. Like, seriously, this shit took me like 15 tries. And a fairly uncomfortable torture for information scene takes place. I know she's complicit in abduction and first degree manslaughter, but uh, yikes. Rance neglects to do anything more to her and chases the princess, though whether that's a good thing or not, I couldn't really tell you at this point. A final fight ensues with Sir Marius, and the princess is left alone with Rance. Oh no. She's surprisingly unfazed under this man's animalistic gaze, as she's pretty confident no one would be stupid enough to even touch the princess of a country. Yeah, so that was Rance 01. Uh, honestly, this whole series is an odd experience. On one hand, I'm all for writing that doesn't shy away from doing something unconventional or delivering something far removed from my comfort zone. On the other hand, it also just ends up feeling like you're watching a crypto scam pulling off a successful rug pull half the time. But at the end of the day, it's writing, world building, and character depth ultimately offsets the negatives for me, and I'd say it's not a bad experience. I've seen some fairly mixed opinions while making this video, some of them treat it as a guilty pleasure, some wear all the rancing, like a badge of honor at the Boy Scouts, and some are disgusted by the premise that they wouldn't even consider touching it. But I'm curious as to what you guys watching it think of it, so do tell me in the comments down below. There's still a lot of content that I didn't cover for Rance Zero One, to be fair, as the site content definitely adds a different layer to the experience, so here's some of the honorable mentions. You can steal panties from a mouse, capture the infamous bread thief that terrorized the castle for months, pee on a dude stuck in a wall, go to jail, and of course, as this is an arrow gay, there are quite a few H scenes that you could initiate. That's about it for today's video. As always, thanks for watching.